course, today is Palm Sunday, and there's a lot could be said about that. This day always uh, puts me in a bit of a quandary. Do I preach about the triumphal entry or about the cross on Good Friday or about something in between? This is Holy Week. There are a lot of things that happened that last week that Jesus was on the earth. Well, and what happened on Palm Sunday was very important, so... Uh, my plan is to speak to you about that tonight. But today I want to go to the cross about what happened on what we call Good Friday. Um, in Luke chapter 23 and verse 33, the scripture says very simply this. And when they were come to the, cro- uh, to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand, and the other on the left. Isaac Watts wrote many wonderful Christian hymns. And his most famous hymn that he wrote, and some have said the greatest English hymn ever written, is the hymn that we sang earlier, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. When Jesus went to the cross that day, uh, there was quite a crowd of people gathered. The soldiers were there to carry out the duty of the execution The Jewish leaders were there. They were excited that their nemesis, Jesus, was finally being put to death. The um, Mary and some of the other faithful women were there as they faithfully followed Jesus all the way to the cross. John, the beloved disciple, was there. He, apparently like the other disciples, had run away in fear, but he came back. And was there to encourage Jesus and be whatever help he could. Jesus' mother, Mary, was there. Like any faithful mother would be. There to the end, though it brought great pain and suffering to her heart. Two thieves were there. One on the right hand. And the other on the left to fulfill prophecy that Jesus would be numbered with the transgressors. And he would die between two thieves. There were curiosity seekers there. When you see the old Western movies and somebody was going to be hanged, people came in. The shows depict that people came in from all around the countryside to see the big event happen, to see somebody hang by their neck till they were dead. And there were people that came to the cross out of that same curiosity and that same thrill seeking. They were there. Today, I want you to go there with me and look at the cross and what the Bible tells us about it and try to see it in in your mind, in your eyes and realize the significance and the importance of what happened at the cross that day. What do we see when we survey the wondrous cross? When When we look at the cross, we see submission. Jesus was all about submission. The submission is apparent in his incarnation. Incarnation means made flesh. When Jesus came and became, uh, came to earth, left heaven and came to earth and became a human being, submission was involved. In Philippians chapter 2, he tells us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and he became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. In eternity when the Father and Son and Holy Spirit planned out the course of human events and the course of this world. They knew and they realized That when they gave man his choice, he would become a sinner. And they realized that for justice to to, to be fulfilled, death must come as a result of sin. And they agreed that they would be merciful to sinners and make a way of forgiveness for them. And in their plan, Jesus submitted to become the one who would come and take on human form and experience life. 
as a human being and experience death as a human being, even the death of the cross. We see his submission in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before the crucifixion took place. Jesus went with his disciples out into that garden to pray. And he took Peter and James and John further into the garden with him. And then he left them and told them to pray. And he went farther and he prayed alone. And as he struggled, he, he knew, he had known before he came to earth that he was going to go to the cross and die. There were prophecies about that. He had told his disciples that what, that's what he was going to do. But as a human... He struggled with that. He knew the pain that would be involved in it. And he did not look forward to the cross any more than you and I would look forward to going to the cross and dying. And he, he, the Bible says he wrestled in such agony that the blood drops came out like, like sweat. And he prayed and he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But then he said, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He submitted to going to the cross. The cross itself shows his submission. Some would look and say, well, you know, from, uh, he was, Jesus was murdered at the cross. And from a human standpoint, he was. And those people, the Jews who demanded it, Pilate who sentenced it, the soldiers who carried it out, they are guilty of murder. They're responsible for their actions. But Jesus said, therefore does my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. He said, no man takes it from me, but I lay it down. He did it willingly. And he said, but I'm going to take it back up again. And that speaks, of course, of his resurrection. So when we look to the cross, we see submission. And how Jesus humbled himself to do what needed to be done for us to be able to have our sins forgiven, to have a right relationship with God. When we look at the cross, we can't help but see the suffering. Crucifixion was invented by the Phoenicians. It was perfected by the Romans the idea of crucifixion was to make death as painful as possible and, uh, and make it to take a while to happen. To let somebody die painfully and slowly. It was reserved for hardened criminals or political revolutionaries, rebels. It was designed to cause as much suffering as possible. The word excruciating describes the worst pain imaginable. And that word excruciating comes from the word cross, the crux, C-R-U-X. It's right in the middle of that. No, uh, no pain could be more unbearable. No pain could be worse than the crucifixion itself. When Jesus died, there was emotional suffering. He'd come to save his people, but they rejected him. He was betrayed by Judas Iscariot. He was forsaken by his disciples as they ran away in fear. He was denied by the leader of the apostles, Peter. Denied, even though Jesus had told him, that he needed to pray because he was going to be tempted severely. And he told him Peter was going to deny him. Peter didn't believe it's possible. He was watched by his mother as she stood there before him. There was this emotional suffering. We cannot uh, aptly describe the physical suffering of the cross. Jesus was up all night Thursday night. That, that, well, first of all, that week, that whole week was one very busy week for him. Then no sleep, no rest on Thursday night. He had been beaten with the whip almost to the point of death. He was forced to carry his cross up the hill until he collapsed. 
And they ordered Cyrene, uh, Simon of Cyrene, to carry it the rest of the way. There he had the nails driven into his hands and his feet. He was stripped naked. It hung up in the sun, the hot sun. He, there as his open wounds began to bleed, the insects came and, and uh, uh, pecked away ate away at the wounds. The birds often came and flew around the, uh, the victims' bodies, pecked at their sores, pecked at their eyes, pecked at their nostrils. There was infection that would set in very quickly from the wounds. There would be in, uh, intolerable thirst from the sun and from the wounds and from the fever that would set in, the infection that would come. And finally, the victim, unable anymore to push himself up with, by putting the pressure on the nails at his feet and on his hands, he would die of suffocation because he could not expand his diaphragm to take in any more air. Physical suffering that cannot be described. There was a spiritual suffering. Jesus was our sin bearer that day. We all know what suffering and agony comes from the guilt of our sins and from the consequences of our sins when they come back to us. Jesus himself, of course, had committed no sin. But he bore our sin that day. For even here, the scripture says that Christ suffered for us on that cross that he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. The Bible says in Matthew that there was darkness from noon till three o'clock in the afternoon. Complete, total darkness in the middle of the day. And at the end of the darkness, Jesus cried with a loud voice. And he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because there had from eternity passed... There had never been a separation from Jesus and his Father and the Holy Spirit. But when he became our sin bearer and he bore our sin for us, the scripture says that God is too holy to look upon sin. And so when Jesus took the sins of the whole world upon him, the Father turned away and could no longer look. And for the first time ever, Jesus experienced the separation from God and when he, his Father. And when he did that, he experienced what hell will be like for the unbeliever to be separated from the presence of the Father. There was suffering. When we look to the cross, we see shame. The crucifixion was uh, used in every case except Jesus and possibly few other innocent uh, victims crucifixion was the result of poor choices of sins that people had committed that uh, it was a, a justice coming home to them and most everybody experiences shame when they are caught in their sins when they are caught and their crimes when it's time to pay for the things that they have done Jesus though he was not a sinner he experienced the shame of the cross nonetheless he was accused falsely of course of being a criminal there was the unfair trials that they held uh, for him he was given an unfair sentence Pilate said more than once, I find no fault in this man. There's nothing worthy of death in him. But still, giving in to the demands of the people, he sentenced Jesus to death. It's one thing, I would think, to suffer for things that you do wrong, to have consequences for Laws that you have broken. But it would have to be quite another. 
to suffer and die for things that you have not done, for things that you are falsely accused of doing. Jesus had the indignity and the shame of being stripped naked as the soldiers gambled for his garments, for his clothing. And the Bible says in Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, every, uh, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. But in Hebrews 12 and 2, it says that Jesus endured the cross, even though he despised the shame. When we look at the cross, we see shame. When we look at the cross, we see scoffing. You, uh, I encourage you to read this. I know you've, uh, most of you have read it many times before, but go back and read, especially uh, Luke chapter 23 this week, chapter 22, chapter 23. There was bullying. We talk about bullying in our schools and bullying in the workplace. There was bullying that day. There was hate speech as people mocked him. Herod had put a purple robe on him, a crown of thorns had beaten him. The soldiers punched him and they taunted him. They said he saved others. Let him save himself. They said they goaded him into, and, and bullied him and teased him and taunted him saying, see, cry out to your father now and see if he'll save you. The thieves one on each side of him, taunted him and said to him, save thyself and us if you're really the son of God. And you know, people still scoff today. They belittle the truth of his virgin birth and say, well, how that, that can't be possible. That's just some fairy tale. They mock his, and scoff about his holy life. They say, how could he be perfect? No one is perfect. They scoff at his innocent death and say, well, he was a revolutionary. He tried to lead a, a, a revolution, and so he got what he deserved. They mock his victorious resurrection and cast aspersions and doubts on it. And of course, if you're going to doubt and mock those things, you're sure going to do the same thing about his glorious return that the scripture talks about. And most of this world is living as though Jesus got what he deserved and he died and that was the end of him. And they're going to be very surprised when he comes back again as the scripture has promised. There was scoffing there that day. When we look at the cross, we see substitution. That's what the cross is about. Substitution. For Christ has also suffered for sins, the just, for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. I love the passage, and you hear me quoted a lot from Isaiah 53 that talks about substitution. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's substitution. 1 Peter 2.24 says that his own self, he bore our sins and his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sin should live under, right, under righteousness. That's substitution. Romans 5 and 8 says that God commendeth his love toward us. Or God proved his love toward us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's substitution. Jesus died in my place. There's a great song called, I Should Have Been Crucified. And that's very true. I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have died on the cross in, dis in disgrace. But Jesus, God's son, took my place. 
when we look to the cross, we see substitution. When we look to the cross, we see separation. And I talked about that already. About the darkness that was there. And Jesus cried out and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When I look to the cross, I see satisfaction. The justice demands that sin be punished. But mercy desires a way to forgive the guilty sinner. And when you come to the cross, you see justice and mercy met together because God's justice is satisfied because Jesus bore our sins. But his mercy is provided for as well that because Jesus died as our substitute, the just for the unjust, then God can punish our sin in him and he can forgive us because our, our justice has been satisfied and sin has been paid for. Isaiah chapter 53 also speaks of God's satisfaction about how that Jesus' death on the cross satisfies the justice of God. So when I look to the cross, justice is satisfied and mercy can be offered. And when I look to the cross, I see salvation. If it were not for the cross, there would be no forgiveness. If it were not for the cross, there could be no salvation. Galatians 2.16 says... Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. The Ten Commandments are good, they're perfect, but they can't save anybody because nobody can keep them. The law, by the law, is the knowledge of sin. And the law was given to us that we might see that we're sinners so that we might turn to the Savior and believe and trust in Him. The Ten Commandments can't bring us salvation. Good works can't bring us salvation. For by grace you're saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can try to be good all you want to, but nobody's good enough. Good works never saved anybody. Religion can't save anybody. Nicodemus was as religious a man as anybody could be. Leader of the Jews. Great teacher of the Jews. But when he came to speak to Jesus, the first thing Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Because being religious doesn't save us. Everybody has some form of religion. Even an atheist is religious because atheism is a religion. Church membership can't save anybody. Judas Iscariot was a member of the church that, that Jesus established. But Jesus said he was a devil from the beginning. He was a tre the treasurer for the church. But he died without Christ. When we look for an example of salvation, we look to those thieves once again. The scripture says that at, at first they both mocked Jesus and they made fun of him. And they accused him. But says one of them turned to Jesus and he said Lord remember me when you come to your kingdom remember me when you come to your kingdom and Jesus said to him verily I say to you today you'll be with me in paradise there is a great example 
of forgiveness and mercy and salvation. Jesus said that that thief who died on one side of him that day went to heaven. And that uh, this man is a mystery to a lot of theologians because they don't understand how could that man, a man who was a criminal, a man who was a thief, how could that man be saved and go to heaven? How could he be forgiven? He had no religion. He had no good deeds. He had a lot of bad ones. He had no baptism. He couldn't get, come down from the cross and get baptized. He was going to die. He died in just a few hours or minutes after this happened. No baptism. He couldn't join the church. No way he's going to walk down an aisle at a church. His feet are nailed to a cross. How could he be saved? What did he have that Jesus could say, today you'll be in, with me in paradise? What he had was faith and trust. Faith in who Jesus is. Faith in what Jesus did. Faith in what Jesus said. He is our example. And this is why Paul said the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto we who are saved, it's a power of God. That's why he could say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's a power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. You know, before Jesus went to the cross... Nobody would have thought about putting a cross up on a building or putting it on earrings to wear in your ears or putting it on a necktie to wear around your neck because the cross was a symbol of shame and death. But it is one of the great symbols, probably the greatest symbol of our Christian faith today because when we see the cross... We see these things that we've talked about today. When we see the cross, we see our salvation. The great Baptist preacher R.G. Lee took a trip to the Holy Land once, more than once probably, but on one occasion, the first time, when the group gathered at Golgotha, the side of the cross, the tour guide asked, has anyone been here before? And R.G. Lee said, yes. I was here 2,000 years ago because that's when Jesus bore my sins here at this place. Well, I've never been to the Holy Land. I've never physically been to Golgotha, to Calvary, to the place of the cross. But I was there 2,000 years ago because my sins were there and Jesus died there for me and I was there 50 years ago I had to count that and it's hard to imagine I was there 50 years ago when as a teenager I gave my heart to him and he became my savior I go back there almost every day and I thank him that he went to that cross and he died for me and he challenges us go back there every day also and he said if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me the cross is a symbol of death and to take up our cross daily is do like he did at Gethsemane where we say it doesn't matter what I want to do God what do you want me to do and not my will, but yours be done. Have you been to the cross? Have you been to this place called Mount Calvary? Do you need to go there today and trust Jesus as your Savior and let your sins be covered and taken away? That's the only way that you'll ever be saved is through the cross and the one who died there. Do you need to go there today in commitment 
and surrender? Has the Holy Spirit been speaking to your heart about things that you're doing that he doesn't want you to do? And you've been stubborn and insisting on doing it your way? Do you need to go to the cross today and say, Lord, I, I, I submit to you and I'll put this thing away out of my life? Do you need to go there today and say, God, you've been telling me I need to do this thing in my life and I've not been willing to do it. But today I'll go and I'll deny myself and I'll take up the cross and follow you. One of the great hymns when I survey the wondrous cross. And I hope you'll look at the cross today and you'll see these things that we've talked about. Let's stand and sing.